Larry Lessig proposed that we should start something called the New Hampshire Rebellion. The idea was that we would go back to our state constitution, which says in Article 10 that government exists for the benefit of all the people, not for the private interests or emolument of any one man, family, or class of men. And it goes on to say in Article 10 that when government ceases to represent the people, the people may and of right ought to reform the old or establish a new government. The famous rebellion clause in Article 10 of our state constitution. And Larry knew because he had been working on this issue already for many years that New Hampshire had a special place, the New Hampshire presidential primary, and that if we could start something a little bit different from the, the usual issue campaigns that come to New Hampshire, the dog and pony show every four years in the primary to take advantage of this platform, if we could start something that had a little more edge, that had a little more passion, and that had a little more sacrifice, that we might just be able to break out in this moment. And we're going to get a bit more of the history, I think, in this presentation of this movement. But going back to fall of 2013, this idea of the New Hampshire Rebellion has been growing and has taken form and has marched and marched and marched. And it began not only the idea, but the marches, the 200-mile march from Dixville to Nashua in year one, the 300-plus miles from all four corners of the state to Concord in year two, and now over 20 marches in different parts of the state have all begun with, and many of them led by Professor Lawrence Lessig. If you don't know him, he came to fame for his work on copyright issues, and in the course of that work came to believe, influenced by people like Aaron Swartz, that that we had to address the root problem. In more recent times, he has been a visionary and an innovator, founding Mayday PAC, which was involved in key congressional races in the 2014 election. And even more recently, as we all know, and I think many of us know personally from our own involvement, launching an audacious campaign for president to inject this issue into the presidential debate. We are blessed as a movement to have a visionary, an intellect, and a passion, a willingness to sacrifice in Professor Lessig. And his leadership has meant a huge difference to me and to the whole movement. And the coming together of the New Hampshire Rebellion and Open Democracy and all the reform players in New Hampshire has been, I think, an important development in the national story that we are a part of. So without further ado, I feel very privileged to introduce, once again, Professor Lawrence Lessig. Larry. Thank you. Thank you. I can't express my gratitude and pride at everything that you've done, Dan and Zani and everybody else in this incredible organization to sit here, to stand here, to look out at everyone and everything that's been done is incredibly moving. But I think we need to go back to the beginning, and the beginning is not Dixville Notch in 2014. The beginning was a woman, a woman who spent 425 days crossing the country with a sign on her chest that reminded America of the need to address the problem, as she put it, of campaign finance reform. And I think there was not a single moment in the suffering of those 425 days when Granny D thought to herself that her work alone would be enough. There wasn't a single time when she thought when she got to Washington, the city would rise up and pass the reforms that were necessary. This wasn't to end the struggle. She knew America had to engage. It was to begin it. She sacrificed, a personal sacrifice, for something she believed was in the common good. 
She believed it was good, representative democracy, responsive to the people, not including the corporations in that list of people, the people, the real people, citizens. And she believed it was no longer responsible. As she wrote in a memoir of the walk, she says, in the past we were able to appeal to the sense of fair play of US senators and representatives. They listened to our appeal and made a decision they thought best. They did not have to consult with their campaign contributors, nor did they care that we had not given money to them. I felt a real sense of belonging as an American back then in the early 60s. There was a sense that we were adults who respected each other and listened to each other. And then there was a change. And she describes how, for the first time in my life, I felt politically powerless something no American should ever feel. It was like living in some other country. This ideal of us created equals had evolved into an equality denied. And so she was fighting for this common good, the good of representative democracy, but she believed it was a common good. It was not just for progressives or for liberals, it was also for conservatives and libertarians. That just as we could imagine a long list of heroes on the movement on the left, there would be, she predicted, heroes on the right, and you saw them here at the movement, Richard Painter and John Pudner, and of course, long before them, people even like Barry Goldwater, who incredibly gave a speech on the floor of the United States Senate where he spoke about, quote, candidates must be more than caricatures who front for donors with the most money. They should not be the paid hands of any vested interest group, nor appear to be so. This representative democracy, this republic, was the common good that we all aspire to in her sacrifice would not be alone enough to restore it, but it would begin the very long road we would have to take as a people to bring it back. So how? What was this beginning? I think Granny D gave us two things. First, she revived the idea of the place of the walk in the center of political movements. She was inspired by Mildred Norman, the peace pilgrim who walked between eight and 20 times across the United States in the course of her life in the name of peace. And she in turn, Granny D, inspired many others, including Rana B, who has walked across 400 miles in Florida in the name of campaign finance reform. And the incredible reform group 99 Rise, led by Kai, who I think is here in the room tonight, who marched 425 miles up California to the capital to demand equality in the way citizens were represented in California. This was a beginning of a new way to think about how political protest here would happen. She defined the movement as a movement we all could participate in as she brought it down to the ground with walking. But I think more importantly, she gave us the courage to fail, the courage to behave ridiculously in pursuit of this cause. She writes in her memoir about an email she received from Williamsport, PA. This is where I grew up, so I know these kinds of people well. The email said to her just after she started, could you have picked a dumber thing to walk across America for? Because of course to many Americans, especially back then, there was no understanding, no recognition of what she saw. But she gave us that courage because in any important struggle, there are only a few who get to the finish line. In any important struggle, there are many, many more who never get close. But that struggle needs those people who move the movement long before anybody could believe victory was within a grasp. Now, when we began, this movement. We began in a similar place. 
We started with a handful of people, 20, who marched most of the way in the first year. This gift of walking, which connected us with people all across New Hampshire and taught us in that connection what this issue meant. And in that walk, she was an inspiration. And in that inspiration, we learned. We learned. What did we learn? We learned we could find in talking about this issue with ordinary people across New Hampshire, an incredible passion. But that passion gets lost in the primary activists that rise up around an election. Because to rally as primary activists is to believe that something real is possible in this system now. But to stand with us is to believe that something big must change before something real is possible in this system right now. And the real challenge, I think we've learned as we've walked the hundreds of miles that this movement has walked, is that the people we need are the people who have no reason to show up. And who shows up? We have to teach to believe that change is not essential. Change is the only way. And the question we have is how can we reach them, those people, to bring them to the place that they show up and make the election turn on the candidates who promise the real change? We've made enormous progress in that. In 2012, this issue was all but invisible in the presidential race. Gallup, in the middle of the summer, did a poll, their quadannual poll, asking what are the most important issues for the next president to address. Number two on that list was reducing the corruption in the federal government. And nobody was talking about corruption as quid pro quo. They were talking about the rise, which was then becoming so prominent, of big money in elections. This was number two for the people. But if you turn to the actual campaigns, the issue was completely invisible. Neither candidate on their list of issues even mentioned this problem. And indeed, as we looked back over the last 10 year, 10 elections, we could not find any other issue that had been on the top 10 of this Gallup poll, but nowhere on the list of issues that either major candidate was addressing. It was silent and invisible and planned to be so. But the push now is even stronger to address this issue because the biggest outside spending we have ever seen is now happening inside this election cycle, and the voters increasingly get it. In New Hampshire, I'm sorry, in Iowa, a poll was done to ask them, if the next president could do just one thing, what's the one thing that that president should do? And the number one answer was to address this corrupt way that we fund campaigns. And for really the first time in the history of this movement, when Americans are asked what solution you would adopt, 72% of Americans Embrace the idea of small dollar public funding of elections to address the corruption of the political system we now have. Rasmussen just this week reports two thirds of Americans would dump all of Congress if they could. 81% of Americans believe the institution corrupt. We now get it. We get it. And this is the moment to celebrate the understanding that movements across this country and especially the work done here have produced that understanding. And now, finally, I think we can say our leaders are beginning to get it. In the Democratic primary, we should be incredibly proud that every candidate has endorsed a platform that includes citizen-funded elections. The one thing we could do tomorrow, the one thing we could do tomorrow that would have an actual effect on paper, both of them, now endorse this fundamental change. And just this week, Change Politics, in partnership with the Concord Monitor, asked candidates, will you commit to making reforms that change the way campaigns are funded a primary objective of your administration? This question was the highest polling question by a factor of two over any other question. And both candidates answered unequivocally, absolutely, and this would be a primary objective 
of their administration. So the Democrats have embraced the change we need. And more exciting to me, though, is on the Republican side. Because for the first time, we see a big money bloodbath that has been encouraged by this crazy man, this crazy, insane clown, let me say, but this man who has introduced to the Republicans the corrupting influence of money such that now Republicans, too, can begin to talk about this openly as a party, reflecting what we've known for the last 10 years, which is that Republicans at the grassroots also are deeply, deeply disturbed by the corrupting influence of big money in politics. We should be enormously proud, and I'm incredibly excited, that we are closer now than we have ever been to building the movement and the strength that we need to win this fight. We have come far. But the work continues. This April, Kai, with organizing, coordinating 80 other groups, will launch an amazing movement in Philadelphia to follow in the footsteps of the New Hampshire Rebellion, to walk from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., and then to sit in at Washington, D.C. to demand fundamental reform from our elected officials. And I know many from the New Hampshire Rebellion will be there. I will be there, too. I hope all of you will be there, at least walking and at least showing up, as thousands have now committed to do to making this issue a central issue in this election cycle. But we must go much further still. Because when we stand back and we say, has this issue really defined the debate in this election so far? I think despite all of our incredible work, the answer is not yet. Most disturbing to me in reading the endorsement that the New York Times did of Hillary Clinton was not so much the decision, which was not so surprising, but the fact in inscribing Bernie Sanders, the New York Times didn't even mention the work that he was doing to attack the corrupting influence of money in politics. It wasn't central enough to even to be a issue that characterizes what his campaign was about. And Bernie, God love him and I love him, Incredible, incredible leader, inspirational leader in that same list of things he would do to make this issue primary. At the end of his list went on to say, over the long term, I believe we need to move toward the public funding of elections. But I say, the long term? The long, what are we doing in the short term? Because I'm a New Hampshire, I'm a Massachusetts Democrat, I'm a Elizabeth Warren Democrat, and on the anniversary of Citizens United, Elizabeth Warren stood on the floor of the United States Senate and she said, this is a terrible decision and we should work as hard as we can to overturn this decision. But she said we should not stop until that decision is overturned. She said we should be acting right now. And as she said, let's start right here with three examples of what this Congress could do right now, what this Congress could do if it had the political courage to stand up to the super wealthy few and big uh, corporations. And what was number one on her list? Number one on her list was to pass the Fair Elections Now Act. Now, the act which is the parallel to John Sarbanes' bill in the House, the act that would fundamentally change the way elections are funded overnight. We could do that and we should be fighting for that right now. We are not there yet. We are not there yet enough to produce a clear mandate for immediate change that will be clear enough to stand up to the incredible power that lives on Wall Street. But we have the chance over the next seven months to make this issue central so that there is the opportunity for the next administration to say this election was, as the New Hampshire Rebellion said it should be, an election about restoring the power of equal citizens to have an effect on their government. We've made progress. We've made progress. But in the metaphor of Granny D, I'm not sure whether we're in Arizona or in Ohio. I just know we're on our way. We are on our way. And as we move, we all personally have to stop and ask ourselves, why are we here? Why are we doing what we are doing? I can't say it was Granny D who inspired me to do this first. 
I met her only virtually. When she ran for Senate, she wanted to guest blog on my blog, and I was happy to have her, but this wasn't my issue then. This only became my issue, as I've described, as I've told the story before. Three years later, because it was in the end of 2006 when my friend, Aaron Swartz, came to me and asked me a question. And Aaron said, looking at the work that I was doing in copyright and internet policy, he said, how do you ever expect you're going to make any progress on the issues you're working on so long as this deep corruption defines the way our government doesn't work. And I was a little miffed at Aaron's question, so I said to him, you know, Aaron, it's not my field. Not my field. And he said, as an academic? I said, yes, as an academic, it's not my field. He said, okay, but what about as a citizen? Is it your field as a citizen? And this is the way Aaron worked. His words spoke like a child's hug. And in that moment, I knew I had no reason. I had no strength. I had no ability to say no. And in that moment, he and I decided we would start this project, a project to take on this corruption and find a way to join the work that others had done to get us a government back. Now, if you've heard of Aaron, you most likely have heard of Aaron because of the tragedy that became Aaron's life, a tragedy told in this incredible film, a tragedy many people have written about, a tragedy which is his life ending in suicide. After he was drawn into a prosecution by the government threatening 35 years in jail for downloading too many academic articles which they thought he would share with people around the world. And two years into that prosecution, Aaron lost hope. And he took his life on January 11th, 2013. And as those who walked in that first walk remember, however much the New Hampshire Rebellion was born in celebration of the incredible work inspiration of Granny D, it was launched in mourning on the anniversary of the day that Aaron Swartz died. And I still remember that first miserable day. It was the worst day of any New Hampshire Rebellion walk. It was sleeting, cold rain as we walked from Dixville Notch to Errol. And there were many who had come up from MIT, including Gene had come up from MIT, who knew Aaron and wanted to mark this day with us. And in those hours of suffering, the thing that kept on coming back to my head as I thought back on this anniversary was, did I do enough? Had I done enough to save him from this incredible act? And that question ached so much because I loved that boy. Like so many, I was inspired. And I had worked with him, and I so much wanted to see him grow old, and I loved and lost that boy. And when you love someone, what that means is you do everything you can, everything you can for that person. And the question that kept on coming back to me as I walked those miles to Errol was, had I done everything I could? But the rest of that walk was a different reflection, because what I recognized on that walk as we met those people was it wasn't just about who I had loved, it was about who I love or what I love. And what I love is this country what I love is the spirit and the value and the ideals of this country. And what I resolved on that walk, the reason I continued to push this so hard was that I would never be in a position to ask myself the question, did I do enough for this country 
that I loved? Did I do everything I could for this country that I love to save it from this catastrophe that we who are here recognize that it now suffers? So however hard these defeats are, those defeats are never as bad as wondering, did I do enough? Did I do everything? Those defeats are the steps along the way to winning this fight we know we must win for these ideals, for these people, for this future that we have. So in honor of the game tomorrow, let me say, let me make a metaphor. We have moved to the ball. Whether across the gold line or just towards the goal line, assuming this time they don't move the goal line, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see soon enough. But what we have done is what we could do as citizens, as Granny D did, not for the certainty of victory, but for the certainty of the love that we all have for country, for democracy, for the best that we can be. We should be so proud, this movement, the New Hampshire Rebellion. Because as Granny D watches over us here, I know she shares our love, and I know she shares my pride in the extraordinary movement we have helped to carry forward. Thank you very much. Thank you.